I'm pleased to be in the office here in the state capitol with Malin Fink on the 70th anniversary of the landing on Iwo Jima. Thanks for spending time to visit with me. You mentioned something, oh, just about an hour ago, that when you landed on February 19, 1945 at Iwo Jima, you had a penny in your pocket. Yeah, I wanted to be sure I wasn't broke. <laughs> there was nowhere to spend it on Iwo Jima, obviously. Uh, no place out there to spend anything, practically. No. But we left Honolulu. <laughs> when, you, when you got off of Iwo Jima, and we've got to fill in the blanks here in a moment, uh, you were injured and you went to a hospital ship. And I know one of the first impulses you had was to tell folks back home that you were okay, but you only had a penny in your pocket. How did that work? Well, I couldn't buy six cent airmail stamps. Eventually, uh, the chaplain did give me airmail stamps, but the first letters I sent home were the V-mail v -mail letters we could send in those days in World War II for free. So I sent two letters home to with the V-mail and <clears throat> the answer I got from my fiance telling her I was wounded, was stained with teardrops, mm. and the one from my mother was, why did you have to join the Marine Corps? Because <laughs> you love your country. Mm -hmm. But it was some time later before you actually got their response to that letter, was it not? Mm -hmm. Had weeks passed? Two months before I did got any mail and my morale was rock bottom and uh, Dinah Shore was singing, I walk alone, and I'm 6,000 miles from home, and I'm quite homesick, and all of a sudden I got 42 letters. 42 letters. <laughs> and all right, how many times did you read those letters over? I can't remember anymore, but it took me, <laughs> it took me quite a while to get through the, the 42. <laughs> and from what I understand, you still have those letters, and yeah. they're upstairs in yes. your house. Uh, that's a wonder, wonderful memory. But Rewinding to Iwo Jima, you land on the shores of Iwo Jima. Um, you're on the beaches there of this sulfur island, which reeks of death and the smell because there were sulfur mines uh, on the island. How much preparation did you have in terms of what you were going to face when you landed on that island? I don't think anybody really knew <clears throat> how soft the sand was and how hard it was to get a vehicle up the beach. and. You took a couple steps forward and took a couple steps back, and it was a hazard. It was a deterrent. Now, the Japanese had months and months of preparation. They had brought in engineers and miners, and, of course, there were sulfur mines on the island. And they were burrowed and embedded on that island, in some cases 40, 50, 60 feet deep, and they had chambers that could hold several hundred men. At what point did the Marines start to realize, wait a minute, these, these fellows are tunneled in and they're following these tunnels and you think you've cleared out a cave area and they pop up somewhere else. Well, like I said, I was just a private first class, so nothing was reported to me, but it took them quite a while to understand that they were underground and we were on top, so we were targets. And you had mentioned the significance of flamethrowers in terms of... Had the flamethrower, the only way we could reach the enemy in their caves and things were... Uh, I doubt if we could have captured Iwo Jima. There was an enemy that was tens of thousands in force, and of course there were tens of thousands of Marines that come ashore, but the losses were horrific. There's yeah. no getting away from the thousands they that were, died. They made vowed to the Emperor to kill 10 Marines before they died. And there were nearly 7,000, uh, I believe, that died, and some 20,000 uh, casualties in addition. Yeah, we had 6,800 killed, and they had, uh, I get asked, how many Japs did I kill? Well, I finally come up with the answer that I aided in abetted in killing 21,000. You, you Everything were, I did, that was aided in abetting. <laughs> you, were, you were a participant yeah. in that conflict. Uh, let's bring us up to day 12. Um, you're on the uh, airstrip that is not completed yet. I think we call it the, the third airstrip or runway. Uh, and there's action up there, and you're in the middle of it. Well, we are dug in on the lower side of the airfield. We crossed that the next morning at 8.30. The air sent them into the rocks and cliffs beyond, and the Japs just poured the, the mortars in on us. It was just a question of time till everybody got hit. That's what, why some of the companies were replaced so many times after. The 242 men composed a company, mm -hmm. and one of the companies had 
replacements that go up into three, four, five hundred on the roster. And the one company walked off the island, 17 that were unwounded, weren't wounded or hit. You yourself were hit. Yeah. Those standing around you were hit. Share that moment if you can. Well, uh, they, when we, when we got into the rocks and cliffs and they started falling, they come at us with like three volleys and they had everything zeroed in. They could put a shell practically any place they wanted it and they would stagger it up the whole line and nothing got close to me in the first volley. And then the second volley, they changed their settings. Now there were different places and I know a shell hit on top of the cliff and stones come down and stung me in the rear end. And, and then the third one, I was where one fell close. And then I was about two, five feet from my legs and I received the multiple shrapnel wounds of both legs. Nothing, nothing deadly. And you end up struggling back to a foxhole you had occupied the night before? Yeah, all of us, all of us were hit. And, and then I couldn't go anymore. And the other two helped me to a first aid station. We were fortunate one was close by and I got treated and sent to the rear to a bigger hospital. And you eventually got on a Higgins boat. And back to that evening, the Higgins boat and taken to a hospital ship. Did you finally sleep well? Yes, I was knocked out that night and didn't wake till the next morning. <laughs> it'd been a little while since you had a bath. Yeah, 12 days. I didn't have much of a whisker in those days, so I was, the shaving wasn't much of a problem. <laughs> I was just a chicken. <laughs> um, in closing, a, a, a few comments and thoughts here. This is a sulfur island. There were sulfur mines. Uh, it was vulcanization, at least historically. In fact, it was on the, the volcano island chain, Iwo Jima, or a sulfur island. What did it smell like? What did it feel like? Describe some of the vents and the heat. Well, uh, there was heat. Like I said, some of the Marines would stick their can of beans down in the, into the sand that was hot and got their beans heated. <laughs> what did it do to your boots, though? <laughs> and the odor from the sulfur was just about the same odor as you got from the dead bodies, and it wasn't pleasant. Um, we know that you're carrying parts of that conflict uh, back with you. You're able to have conversations about it today. Was it always that way for you to be conversant about Iwo Jima? Well, for 50 years, it was nothing. Uh, in fact, I was home here 20 years before I realized they raised two flags. So I got the full story. So uh, there was there was nothing that my even my neighbors never even knew I was on Iwo Jima until after 50 years and then the, the Desert Storm and some of the other battles now uh, now now we're that come to light and now we're heroes. Before that, we were nothing. <laughs> you were a hero then too, even if they they didn't know. In terms of that change. Um, you grew up in an era where we refer to it as the greatest generation, and we esteem that patriotism highly. Are we returning to a time in America where we're honoring the flag and veterans and the patriotism uh, has crested to a different level? Well, uh, I often thought oh, there'll never be Marines like us that would be that dedicated, that charged, but they are. There are still Marines that look forward to battle. I've served with men that uh, bravery, I seem bravely like you would never believe. Are you optimistic about the future of America based on what you've just described? Well, uh, I figure the world is in worse shape today than it was in World War II. With the, all the ISIS and the terrorists and I don't know what the world's coming to, but. Uh, Fortunately, I'm not going to be around too much longer to see what's what happens. <laughs> well, we hope the good Lord gives you a decent number of years, and uh, we're very optimistic about that. You're just 89 years young now, right? Yes. As we close, there were two things that stood out in a conversation that I had with you just a short while ago. When you were on Iwo Jima, you had mentioned your mother and you'd mentioned prayer. What thoughts were going through your mind? Well, uh... When that machine gun bullets were kicking up two inches from my feet, the first person I thought about was my mother. 
And secondly, I prayed to God for deliverance. And I did that again when we were training for the invasion of Japan because I knew I probably was going to die, but I was saved by the atomic bomb. Hmm. You saw your mother, you're back home. What was that intersection like when you returned? Well, I could hardly explain it. Uh, it's the first I've seen my mother in 26 months and the same with my girlfriend. And uh, I got home on a Saturday morning and lo and behold, her brother was going to be married that afternoon and that was postponed. Then I was the best man the following Thursday. <laughs> so I got into it anyhow. Just between us, as we finished, who gave the harder hug, your mother or your fiance? I believe my fiance. Uh, I was one of 12 children. Uh, not that my mother wasn't a great woman, but it was not the, how shall we say, the sad carrying on like you normally would think. Okay. And my dad was on the back roof of a extension of the house working when I walked around to see him and it was a handshake and uh, it wasn't quite a hug from my mother, but she was just glad I was home. She did write to our congressman. When I didn't come home after the war, I got sent to Japan for seven months. I want my son home, He's, the war's over. And the letter she got in return was, when his points come up, he'll be sent home. <laughs> <laughs> when I had 40 points, and then when I got back to San Diego, they were discharged at about 31. <laughs> well, thank you for joining me. Your prayers were answered, and your mother's prayers were answered. Yes, were. we're glad you made it back to share that story with us. Thank you very much. Thank you, Malin.